you're empowering that employee or that person with more options, right? That that person does not want to go to a payday lender. They don't they don't want to go to the employer and ask for an advance. It's rather embarrassing. They don't want to to take money from the till. And that that's something that we've seen uh, on demand pay actually be a benefit or benefit to you is like you'll have a, a QSR type operation that will deploy it or a convenience store or whatever, and they'll report you know, a ninety percent reduction in theft from the till, which to me has always just spoken to the, the humanity of it, right? Like people don't want to do those things. Welcome to Mission to Grow, the small business guide to cash, compliance, and the war for talent. I'm your host, Mike Vinoy. Each week, we'll bring you experts in accounting, finance, human resources, benefits, employment law, and more. You'll learn ways to access capital through creative financing and tax strategies, tactical information you need to stay compliant with ever-changing employment laws, and people strategies you need to win the war for talent. Mission to Grow is sponsored by Assure. Assure helps more than 100,000 businesses get access to capital, stay compliant, and develop the talent they need to grow. Enjoy the show. On-demand pay, the new must-have benefit for employers and employees. Hi, I'm Mike Vinoy, your host of Mission to Grow. Uh, a, a lot of people don't realize, I think, how much the makeup of the workforce has changed. You know, I, I, we, we've gone through so much in this last, you know, three, four years with a with pandemic and presidential cycles and wars, inflation, that, that I think a lot of times we, we lose sight that there's been a fundamental change in the makeup of the workforce. In 2020, is the first time in U.S. history there's more people overworking their age than there are underworking age. In, in based on you know birth rates of 30, 40, 50 years ago, the available workforce is flattening uh, as the economy continues to try to grow. And, and therefore, this labor shortage that we feel, this isn't just some short-term thing. This this is this has been baked in for a long time. And the employers need to understand uh, the long-term impact of this war for talent and implement solutions and strategies to, to deal with it. One of them is uh, employee financial wellness. There's nearly 100 million Americans. They live paycheck to paycheck. Uh, according to the Federal Reserve's annual survey of, of U.S. households, 37% uh, in growing, this is up, I think it's 5% year over year, 37% of uh, Americans couldn't afford a $400 emergency. So... Uh, something happens to the, to the house, the heater, the air conditioner, the car, uh, a, a medical emergency that's not covered. Uh, our employees are living on the edge more than they ever have. And, and I think this is something that employers really need to deal with and, and think about. So i uh, got a great guest to unpack this topic today. Uh, he's an experienced executive focused on business development and corporate strategy. He's been a longtime advocate for the financial wellness and health wellness platforms. Uh, his firm is an early stage innovator in what is now this booming uh, industry of earned wage access, where his company delivers flexible liquidity to employees, improved employee satisfaction, ultimately lower turnover and higher retention rates for employees. Please welcome to the podcast, uh, VP from Zayzoon, Shane Edrington. Awesome. Thank you very much, Mike. Appreciate having me on. Yeah. So Shane, let's maybe just start out. First question, what is it that you think employers need to understand about earned wage access, on-demand pay, if they're going to try to grow their business today? Uh, well, they should understand. I mean, outside of trying to grow their business, just understand about earned wage access in general is is what it is and what it isn't, right? And, and I think that just because it serves a need that many other products out there serve, it kind of sometimes gets lumped into the same basket. So when I say that, like there's things as egregious as, you know, payday loans or overdraft fees, or in some ways going to your employer and asking for an advance, because that can be egregious from like an embarrassment to relationship management perspective. Um, yeah. you know, it, it's easy to try and put it in that basket because those products, you know, really what they're doing is they're saying, hey, somebody needs a couple hundred dollars for a very short period of time. Here's a way to get that, right? But I think that what they also need to understand is that a lot of the population serves that same need in other ways, right? So if you're a, a quote unquote, a paper borrower person, right? You might serve that need with a credit card, right? Or you might, you know, dip into uh, savings can also be viewed in, the, in much the same way, right? So it's just a cash flow issue that we're serving. Uh, employees are getting access to, to better liquidity or access to improve cash flow. And that in of itself 
allows them to save money on fees or improve their financial condition, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's important to know that just because it serves the same need, again, what it is and what it isn't by way of what it costs, what the experience is, et cetera. In terms of how it can help grow the business, I mean, employers have to be competitive. I mean, it's, it's as you were uh, you know, discussing distinctly in your, in your intro, I mean, it's, it's tough out there, right? The, the job market is difficult. Ever since COVID, it's been very challenging for employers to find employees and to retain uh, employees. And so anything that employers can offer uh, a potential or a prospective employee is, is important. And how they get paid or how they access their pay is something that you know, before a few years back, maybe at this point, you know, five, seven years back was just not even on the table. It was like, well, you get your paycheck when you get your paycheck. And so you might start today and you might not get paid your first dime for a month in some cases. Yeah. Well, now if you're that employer today that you don't, that employee doesn't get their first dime for a month versus someone who can literally access it the next day. I mean, that's, that's incredible, right? There's a huge uh, delta there. Yeah. And to be clear, so maybe we should pause, like give a definition of what on-demand pay is. Cause, cause this has changed so much. I mean, you go from the whole payday loans industry, which I mean, it, it, it served a need. Um, it's, it's maybe a little slimy and stinky. And uh, so maybe I hate, but it's, I don't know. I hate to criticize it too much because it, it, it clearly served a need. Um, but there's this whole burgeoning field, companies like yours, Azun, that provides this on-demand pay in, in ways that are, I'd say, clearly much more ethical, uh, easy to do business with, uh, that, that serve the same need and, and hopefully you know, putting the, the payday loan folks out of business. I you know, hate to maybe say that, but get, get, un unpack for us what is on-demand pay uh, same day pay, earned wage access, lots of different things people call this. Yeah. So I mean, on-demand pay is quite literally the ability for an employee to access a portion of the earnings they've already accrued, just have not yet received. And so it's their money, it's their assets. They just have not been able to receive it yet by way of their employer because the employer is not going to process payroll every single day. Payroll is challenging. Payroll takes time. Payroll costs money. It, it just doesn't make any sense. And so when you look at what on-demand pay or earn wage access is today and why it wasn't available you know, in the past, it wasn't just a great idea. It was literally a limitation in many things, like ability to access the data that would verify what earnings have been accrued and the ability to transfer money to those employees because they're oftentimes in, in an emergency or they need the money right away. Instant transfer of funds was not a thing until just the last, you know, in reality, you know, a short period of time. And so those things coming together has allowed on-demand pay to be what it is. And so as much as I would be uh, very open to criticizing the, the payday loan industry and overdrafts and all those kinds of things, th those industries and those solutions are born from a lack of data, a lack of ability to verify the, right. the risk element that they're taking and, and other things that we can talk about, like, you know, brick and mortar expenses and things like that. Yeah. You know what? I, we, we probably have some, some payday loan businesses their customers are so i'm, I'm going to walk back my criticism just to touch yeah it's a really good point you make i mean if you're gonna if you're gonna advance someone money based on what their last say three paycheck stubs said they make you don't even know if they're currently employed or maybe their their hours were reduced and that's why they're coming in for this loan you had to hedge your risk because you didn't have access to seeing how many hours have been accrued or how much how many dollars have been accrued right in this given pay period. So, you know, that they, they they've been probably rightly criticized for some probably predatory pricing models, but it's a completely different risk profile when someone says, "Hey, I need an advance on my paycheck and you've never met me before. Uh, how much are you going to risk, right?" Yeah, uh, all money, right? All, all offerings of, of money, whether it is a loan product or whether it's something different than a loan, like an earnings access solution or on-demand pay, is generally born of, of how economics can be put together by way of what risk you're taking, how much it costs you to facilitate the transfer of funds, other operational. It's, it's a business like anything else, right? And so, yeah, it, it's very easy to criticize other types of solutions, but usually those solutions, even though there's a layer of uh, inappropriate or bad actors that are on there, that the models themselves still experience pressure, still exp experience market pressure. So you would say, well, why are they still so expensive? They must have elements of their model that force them to be, right? And so earn wage access, non-demand pay has dramatically reduced the impact of those particular elements by way of risk. And it's very virtual and high volume. And uh, again, 
kind of like a business lesson here when it comes to like margins and economics, but th that's the basic reason as to why on-demand pay has become so much better than other solutions. So w without making this a, a, a Zazun pitch, d mechanically, how does this work if you're an employee today? I mean, it, it, it starts here, right? Yeah, for sure. So I mean, as far as if, if you're an employee that has access to on-demand pay, it means you have access through your employer and or through your payroll or PEO provider. And so it, it's simple for the employee. The employee can go into the portal of a particular you know, on-demand pay provider. They're shown generally what they have access to. And that does vary a bit by provider, but right now across the board as to what you know, calculates that, but they have access to some portion of their accrued pay. They decide where they would like to receive that pay. That part of the experience can vary provider by provider. So are they you know, putting on a card uh, that they that they take as part of their employment, a payroll card or whatnot? Are they pushing it to their bank account? Are they pushing it to a selection of gift cards, whatever it is? But the fact of the matter is that when this is functioning, on-demand pay is functioning for an employee, they can jump onto a portal, request their funds, receive their funds and spend their funds in a matter of minutes. Right, right. So it's fast, it's easy, it's safe. Uh, uh, the other side of the equation, the provider has access to data to underwrite the risk uh, appropriately. Therefore, they don't have to charge as much to, to, to account for, for any of that risk. So, exactly right. let's, so let's talk maybe a, a bit about the, 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 some of the mega trends around financial wellness for employees. I think, I think as an employer, it'd be easy to think, well, I'm not going to participate in this and contribute to my employees' lack of discipline I remember this years and years and years ago. I just watched a video the other day. It was going through my reels. Uh, and it was uh, interviewing people at a McDonald's. With, this is I don't know, three decades ago, maybe more, four decades ago, when they were accepting credit cards uh, for the first time. And people were scoffing. How irresponsible you must be to use a credit card to buy a, a $2 cheeseburger, right? And, 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 and so I can see some employers maybe pushing back on this concept thinking maybe it's just their employees have a lack of financial discipline. They're not going to play a role in that. I, I think a lot of folks just don't understand, you know, that's why I opened the, our conversation with hundred million Americans living paycheck to paycheck. Like how bad is it for folks? Yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. Um, and, you know, I, I, from my own personal background, I've been in this space for, I don't know, I keep saying 15 years, but the years stretch by, so maybe it's 17, 18 now, I don't know, but, in the financial wellness slash benefits slash payroll HR tech space. And so there's always a lot of talk about financial wellness and what does or does not improve it. And, and I've grown pretty cynical about the actual term financial wellness being a, a fairly uh, inaccurate bucket term for a lot of things that just are either just content providers or they're just things that just don't happen to directly improve financial wellness. They have some like third layer indirect benefit that you can you know tie to the term. And so for me, it's it's more about you know, are you giving employees access to something that will directly improve their financial position? And is it tact you know, tactically and, and pragmatically even just going to improve their life? And so when we look at something like on-demand pay and you take it up to the employer and the employer takes a very um, paternal perspective in some cases and says, hey, this isn't good because it's actually better for my employee base that I hold their money because who knows what the heck they would do with it if they had it, you know, 13 days earlier or 29 days earlier. How are they going to pay their rent if they go out and buy, you know, 36 packs next week? That, that is what, what you hear a lot of. And, and all I can do, and I don't know, it depends on the audience in which I use this example because it doesn't necessarily resonate with everybody, but to the extent you have like business owners, you know, watching this thing, it's like, you know, tie yourself back to a time. And I, I've run companies and, and small businesses in particular, where you, you run the company, it was on a tight cash flow line, right? You're, you're up and down, you're in between the red and the black. Sometimes there's, there's issues where you might not make that utility bill payments or payroll or whatever. Yeah. Most businesses receive their receivables, their AR, right? Pretty continuously throughout the month. And you would ask that business owner quite directly, hey, would it have made that time at that point in your business easier or more difficult to get all of your receivables on one day of the month? Or do you actually get some smoothing and some benefits and some you know, strategic options as to how you manage your cash flow and your finances when you have a steady flow or at least steady access to those receivables? And I've never met a business owner that said, oh yeah, please send me all my money on October 15th and I'll make everything work. Like there's more flexibility. Now, can people 
you know, do the wrong things. Well, yeah, yeah, but they can do that anyway, right? So right. I think I think the opinions there really lie in that understanding, and I think it's getting better as to how people view that scenario. Yeah, and and if you just look at the macro numbers, I mean, if a hundred million Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, it's not because you got a hundred million people who don't automatize their money. The 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 reality is. Wages has, have not gone up in the last two decades at the same rate as the rest of the economy. It, they, they just haven't. It, it, it's, it's just put this massive squeeze. It's not just the lower end of the, of the, of the economic ladder. It's the middle class has is, is really gotten squeezed on, on wages. And so I, I agree with you. Mathematically, of course, there can be some folks who maybe they just aren't good at managing their money and they, and they, and they need some help. And education, and we can put really? a path with the year. Um, but the reality is, if if a spouse walks out the door in a domestic issue, and mom's trying to buy groceries uh, to feed her three kids, and doesn't have it for, because you know the other half left the house with the car and what, basically, that's none of your damn business <laughs> if you're the employer, right? And even if it was, and even if you cared deeply about that person, it's up to that person if they share that, any of that information with you. And if you have a way to that they can access their paycheck a few days early, what the hell harm is there in that, right? Yeah, well, you're, you're empowering that employee or that person with more options, right? That that person does not want to go to a payday lender. They don't, they don't want to go to the employer and ask for an advance. It's rather embarrassing. They don't want to to take money from the till. And that, that's something that we've seen uh, on-demand pay actually be a benefit, or benefit to you is like, you'll have a, a QSR type operation that will deploy it or a convenience store or whatever. And they'll report you know, a 90% reduction in theft from the till, which to me is always just spoken to the, the humanity of it, right? Like people don't want to do those things, right? They want- You and I have talked about this before. Uh, unpack yeah. that. I want to make sure everybody really understands that because this is, this is like a, a a massive example where it's so easy to think bad employee, they're a, they're, you know, they're a liar, they're a thief. What, what, the before after of implementing an on-demand pay is, is so dramatic. Yeah, take, take us through more detail there. Yeah. So the, 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 the details of it are like, let's, let's say you have a Burger King operation that has, you know, 60 employees and they have some amount of what they at least record to be theft from their till on a monthly basis or annual basis. Prior to having on-demand pay in place, which would which would be and to to your point, okay, they hired a few bad apples that would just steal from the till no matter what. They're opportunists, right? That oh, somebody's not looking. There's a twenty right there. I'll just I'll just snatch it. And then they they turn on on-demand pay and they give the employee base options and they reduce the squeeze that person is feeling from lack of options. And all of a sudden, like as if by magic, the the theft from the till drops by ninety percent. Hard, hard to hard to describe the impact of that. Like when, when I when you get when you guys first told me that number, I'm like, I could just see myself as the employer, you know, being pretty judgy, finger waggy. How dare you steal from me? Yeah, but if it dropped by ninety percent, oh my god, they really were just. Whether it's for good reasons or bad reasons, they're living paycheck to paycheck. They simply needed the money, and they 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 were opportunistic because they felt backed into a corner, right? Yeah, and there's to be honest, there's so many numbers or, you know, ROI elements or various things that, that you kind of look and, oh, that's fun with numbers. I can't really tie that to a particular impact. But this one for me, again, just from a humanity perspective, like your employees felt so squeezed that they had to do something they would never, ever have done. And you gave them something that now costs you nothing, doesn't really require anything from you for the most part. And, and they won't, they won't steal from you anymore. Like how much better must the employees feel that they don't have to be that person anymore? This is it's right. crazy. Right, right. What about just other financial stressors? I think you probably have some data and some stories that just be, maybe they never stole from the till, um, but they're still living really, really, really tight in the financial stress, what that does to work productivity. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, as far as, you know, when you talk about work productivity, it's, what does that really tie to? Like, do you, do, you, do you picture someone that just all of a sudden starts working harder, uh, just in, in general, on something like basal elements? I, mean, I, I don't necessarily think so, but but they're far less distracted and concerned with that squeeze right. that they're feeling, right? So they may not steal from the till, 
But I can tell you what, rather than working in their eight hour, whatever their shift is, in the back of their mind is constantly spinning like, wow, my electricity is getting shut off tomorrow. Or I, I have to get my, my son's medication, uh, which has a copay. And I don't have that. Like, how am I gonna, that's, that's dominating their brain and, and rightfully so. I mean, right. just removing that from their mind frees them up to be productive. And then from the absenteeism side of, of productivity, like they're not having to call out to go across town to the payday lender or to figure out some way to make ends meet or to have some secret, you know, second gig that, that they have to have to, to make ends meet. Like, oh, I have to make this hundred bucks by tomorrow. I'm going to call out from this employer and go drive Uber for the afternoon. And I have to imagine right. that's a real thing. Right, right. There's no question that's got to be a real thing, right? Yeah, for sure. Well, what would you say, what, what's your, share some insight, Shane, around just macro trends. I mean, I think about my daughters. When they go babysit, they, they get paid on Venmo on the, on the ride home. Psychologically, that's just, they're used to getting paid that way. They, they, you know, they go enter the workforce. They're just going to think it's weird. Why would you wait? two weeks plus another full week to get my first paycheck that just, that just feels out of step with reality. Now they're young and uh, they're not in the workforce yet. One, one will be very soon. She's in college. Um, but this, this is a thing. This is an expectation with the next generation workforce of just an expectation. But what, what do you have to say about that? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I don't know if we're in the, the exact same age bracket here, Mike, probably pretty close though. And like our, our, my age bracket would always get criticized for consuming. We, we both have white here. I just have oh, more. I, I got plenty of white. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Nonstop. But like, I, I think, you know, we would get criticized when we were younger for just having attention spans or expectations of, of delivering value or, or kind of a reward type response, right? In a matter of say, uh, minutes instead of hours, like our parents might would expect it. And now it's, it's seconds, right? Like my, my son is 12, my daughter is eight and, it doesn't directly tie uh, to financial aspects directly, but it's analogous, right? Like they expect to receive what they want right away and they have everything at their fingertips and they can generally rationalize a lack of that immediate response if it makes sense, but they're asking questions when things don't make sense. And so to your point, now you got someone who's going to be whatever, you know, 20, 22 years old, 23 years old, getting that first job. It used to make sense they couldn't get paid for two weeks or four weeks because, again, payroll takes time. It's complicated. You got to do it right, and your employer's not going to do it daily. Well, if they know it's out there, they're kind of like, well, I've, I've earned this money. I'm, I'm basically lending it to you, right? Like, I'm lending it to my employer for your own convenience, and I get nothing from it. Like, this doesn't make sense. And they're going to call, they're going to call BS on that, right? That's right. That's right. So we talked about maybe on, on one end of the spectrum, uh, people with financial hardships, uh, you know, inflation, cost of living, uh, lagging wages compared to the rest of the economy, kind of creating the squeeze. We talked maybe the other end of the spectrum where uh, just new entrance into the workforce and in this, uh, you know, a mobile first on demand real time expectation that they just simply have, um, you know, throw in a little TikTok training of, of the prior decade and their in need for instant gratification and dopamine hits. They want that. They want that pay pretty quickly. Um, what about just competition for labor? I mean, I see, I, I'm starting to see like you walk into a restaurant and it's the sign right on the door says, uh, 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 get paid at the end of your shift, things along those lines. And I just envision in this war for talent, if I got a restaurant on one side of the street and I got another restaurant on the other side of the street and one says help wanted, great benefits. The other one says, help wanted, great benefits, get paid at the end of your shift. Which, which, which place is the workforce going to go to, right? I mean, this seems like an untapped competitive advantage for labor. It definitely is. It does segment the labor uh, into cohorts or labor population to cohorts, right? So like, if, if you and I were go looking for a job, I don't think we'd be necessarily just candidly. I don't think we'd be the ones looking for like, hey, get paid tomorrow. Like it's not going to be our, our thing that we are really looking for. It might be like, hey, do you do a 401k match or, you know, those kinds of things. But there's right. a significant portion of the labor force that when they go in there, the, if it just says great benefits, I mean, they don't really associate any value. I mean, really, it's just words to them. They're not going to use any of those things. They have to go and select them voluntarily and pay for them. I can't even pay for my groceries. So. It doesn't mean anything. What they're looking for is actual upfront 
hey, how much can I get paid and how quickly can I get access to it? And yeah. hey, what options do I have for making more if I do, you know, th those kinds of things, right? That's really what it is. And so you're right. I've, I walk into businesses all the time. I was in the grocery store yesterday and on the table of the application table was a, you know, eight and a half by 11 sign that was specifically talking about, you know, get hired today, get paid tomorrow. Um, it's, it's what they want. Now, you brought up the point uh, this is of cohorts. So if I run a software development company, probably everybody in my firm makes enough money. They're not living paycheck to paycheck. This isn't a, a big need. Clearly, this targets uh, uh, more entry-level work, uh, entry-level wages. Um, do you have data that would suggest where these thresholds sit of, you know, X dollars per hour, X salary kind of ranges where you see uh, uptake in utilization of these services? Yeah. I mean, so it used to be that the window was like, you know, call it 30 to $60,000, very much in the early days of the industry, because you, know, you had to make enough money to get into some kind of like, you know, cash flow issue, right? If you're, if you're 16 years old and you have no bills, I mean, what kind of cash flow crisis can you really have, right? Uh, if right. you're a you know, 30 year old with uh, a young child and you got a, a rent to pay and, and bills, then sure, you can have a, a big issue there. And the $60,000 mark was even pretty fuzzy because even beyond that, people do live paycheck to paycheck, but those individuals tend to have outside means to cover those gaps, whether it's credit cards or whatever else. And yeah. that was always easy. It made a lot of sense, right? So you, you would get more uptake from the manager of a QSR location than, say, the high school students working there. As, as and when you say QSR, what is QSR? So a quick service restaurant. Okay. They don't let people fast food restaurants anymore. So quick service restaurant. Uh, and so now that's actually shifted, I think, on the top and the bottom. On the bottom, when I say the younger population, it's more about what, what you brought up, which is they may not need the money. Right? They, they don't have a bunch of bills, but they just expect it. And it bothers them that they don't have it. It bothers them that you're holding it as their employer. Like, it's mine. Give it to me. So there's that. So that's expanded the window down to all, all the way down. Like they want on-demand pay just because they feel like it's what they should have. And the top has gone up for the other things you brought up in terms of you know inflation and just uh, you know stagnant wages and whatever else. Like, that $60,000 is now probably $80,000. And so we see that window rising. And as far as living paycheck to paycheck, again, it's increased over time. It's now, I, mean, I have a mortgage background. I've taken thousands of applications back in the day. And I can just tell you, unfortunately, that most people, despite what you think their job is or how much money they may or may not make, very, most people don't have any money at all put aside. And so living paycheck to paycheck uh, from that point in time, which for me was you know 20 years ago to today, has actually just gotten worse. You, plenty of six-figure earners that are, are living paycheck to paycheck. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, maxed out credit lines and credit cards and everything else, right? Yeah. They're, they're doing a dance and, and they could, they could own a million dollar home, but you know, in two years they have to do a cash out refi to pay off a bunch of debt they accrued. It's, I mean, there, there are habits here at play. There are bad decisions at play for sure. And I think that that's a factor more often than not at the higher income thresholds, but at the core of that labor market, where you're talking about the people pulling down, you know, 30 to 60 or 30 to $80,000 a year, like they have unavoidable things again, that you brought up before that they just hit them. I mean, they're, they're living paycheck to paycheck because things are tight and things are expensive and wages have been stagnant. And then they blow a tire or their kid gets sick or they get sick or, you know, again, you know, something bad happens and they don't have the buffer to carry them through that. What other benefits do you see for employers for implementing an on-demand pay solution with, whether it's Zazoon or somebody else implementing a vendor? What, what, what other benefits are there to employers here? Yeah, I mean, we've kind of, we've talked about employee satisfaction, you know, kind of um, adjacently with a lot of those other things. But the fact of the matter is that your employee base is just happier when they don't have to, again, this isn't all of them, but even consider taking money from the tailor. They don't have to consider that they might have to next week walk up to you and ask for an advance. Or they don't have to worry about calling out because they have to go to that payday lender. So the employee satisfaction is huge because that directly reduces turnover. And so reducing turnover and increasing the ability for employers to be competitive in the hiring landscape are the primary benefits for employers. I mean, we have had be the call out stats like a 29% reduction in turnover, which equates to around $10,000 a year in savings for every 100 employees paid. So that's like directly the bottom line benefit to employers. Yeah. I personally think that although, you know, most businesses are bottom line driven as they, they, they need to be, 
I do think that many employers find a great deal of benefit in just knowing they've given their employees something that is actually useful on a day-to-day basis. It isn't something that they've been sold to just add on to a benefits pool, just to, you know, kind of ambiguously extend the value of the benefits pool. This is something they, they deploy on day one and they see instant utilization and impact to their employee base. Yeah. Um, what advice do you have for employers who are thinking about, oh, I would, I would hope, um, I mean, this isn't meant to be a sales pitch. This is the purpose of mission to grow is to share information with employers to, to help them grow their business. Um, I, I believe in my bones, this is an important thing. It'll be interesting to see over the next call it 20, 30 years, you know, you'll go back 20 years and it was, it was clear separation from a payroll being run to the payday loan industry. And here we are, this explosion of this earned wage access, on-demand pay. 20 years from now, I mean, I, I kind of think this is just going to be the way payroll works. It's not even going to be this separate feature. Um, I think people would just expect that they'll take down the money whenever whenever they want it in probably the currency that they want it, whether it's whether it's dollars or yen or uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever it is, right? Um, where, 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 where do you see this continuum going? Yeah, that's a very, uh, we could nerd out for hours on, on that, Mike, and I, yeah. I would I love doing that. Um, but, but you're right. It's like right now, employees, again, to, to kind of state the same thing again, is like they, they, they accrue an asset that's theirs and it sits there. So there's inefficiencies in terms of the velocity or accessibility that they can, you know, get access to their own asset. And then when they do get it, it goes to their paycheck, which more often than not is going to go to a banking instrument. And it could be a bank account or a payroll card or, or whatever. And some physical checks obviously are still out there and in a higher number than I thought would still be the case, you know, when I would look at this 10 years ago, right? So, but they're, they're going to go to a destination that is going to be some limited, like a, a fee-based or, or complex experience. And they have to take it from there and they have to go use it at merchants. And those merchants are using merchant processing and there's a fee-based or kind of some level of experience. And so, that money is really getting kind of watered down across that whole flow by way of time access and what it's worth at the end of the day. And so I think you're right from the, from the area of payroll. I mean, why right now it's been, you know, X number of minutes that I've been quote unquote on the job. Shouldn't that just be available to me right now? And I could take that mindset. Like it's not even my full day. I'm just like, right. it works. Like, where's it, where is it? Like it could get that like available. Right. Well, you used the example earlier. I mean, I could, if I'm struggling, do I take a PTO day can, and fake that I'm sick so I can go drive Uber or DoorDash that that day because I need the money that night, right? So this isn't just the kids coming up and those stinking kids and their their you know, you know, bad expectations. This is this is just the the I'd say the mega trend that I don't think any of us are stopping. You know, and I think it does have application that is specific to, again, particular cohorts of individuals or, or types of employment. And this goes back to, I think, a conversation around like the, the COVID times when, when virtual work was really born. And we would talk a lot about, hey, you know, virtual work and the flexibility of it. And as long as you get your job done, you work whatever hours you want. And we would tout those benefits. And then we'd go, oh, well, actually, there's certain types of jobs where that isn't the case. Like they're, they're on a, in a job where you literally have to work minute by minute in a particular window of time and all these things we touted didn't really apply to them. And so I think that also goes in this conversation a bit like, so for me as a, a quote unquote, you know, my, my role is I, I lead a sales team. And so do I earn money minute by minute? Like not really, but maybe uh, a person who's in um, customer support who has an eight hour shift, maybe, maybe they do, or maybe an hourly worker at, at a quick service restaurant, maybe they do. And so it, it'll be interesting to see how that evolves by way of like, how people get access to you at the granular level, what they've earned or haven't earned and, and where that access, uh, yeah. how, how, it, how it works, where can they put their money? How can they spend their money? Can they spend their money directly from, from, you know, their paycheck as opposed to having to go through layers of transferring funds to bank accounts and POS servers and et cetera, et cetera. Like we're, we're in a phase where, where we're moving middlemen all over the place. Um, even in, in real estate, we saw an announcement over the weekend that they, uh, I, I'm not going to say this very well, but like they changed how that kind of classic 6% real estate fee was fairly like mandated or at least like just accepted and they've, they've shattered that. Right. So 
where else are we going to see that kind of play out when it comes to various financial instruments right. and, and different levels? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, so I, I, I retrade just a bit. I, I, hopefully this kind of makes a whole bunch of sense. It's like, okay, uh, I, I, I'm an employer. I want to, I want to help my employees as much as I can in an anonymous way that they don't have to share their financial burdens with me. Maybe I'm working on razor thin margins and maybe I'm, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm losing money and I'm just trying to survive as an entrepreneur. Uh, so I don't have more money to give them, but it, let's talk mechanics about implementing this because this doesn't cost the employer anything. This is really about logistics of rollout in, in activation, right? Yeah, so the, the vast majority of providers, it doesn't cost the employer anything to implement. The implementation process uh, can be very streamlined and simple. Like, you know, some will actually have you activated within a matter of minutes if you're not already activated. And it's more about just like an awareness exercise. And yeah. sometimes there's there's steps for implementation. So there could be setting up file transfer protocols or where are they going to get the data that they need, you know, et cetera. So it depends on, you know, who you are as a business, what your capabilities are, where your data lies, uh, how much time you want to invest in the upfront process, and then what is required by the, the vendor that you choose. Well, in, in full transparency, again, not a sales pitch, we're just sharing information, but it, our relationship, Assure has a strategic relationship with Zayzoon where we have all this integration already built. So if you're an existing customer, you could simply just turn this on for your employees. They can start accessing it like within minutes today. Uh, or if they're if you're not an Assure customer, you join, you get on payroll, but inherently as part of our payroll service, all of your employees then have access to this because we already have that integration pre-built. Yeah, exactly right. And then again, not sliding into a, a, a sales pitch, but just because we talked about the, the, the factors of the business as it relates to like uh, being a lot better than say like a, a payday loan operation by way of risk and transferring costs, you know, et cetera. Even within the scope of on-demand pay providers, providers have made choices, right? And those choices are how much risk we're willing to take, even in this far lesser risk continuum than say a payday lender might take, but how much risk are we willing to take? And how are we going to, you know, either uh, give our customers or the employees optionality around destination? And does that provide revenue? All these things they have to do, right? And so you have to look at the vendor and say, what choices have they made? And what benefit does that provide me as an employer or put on my back as a thing I have to cover, right? And so expenses, yeah, we've all as providers pretty much settled into the fact that, um, you know, it's going to be free. But free in terms of like, do you have to provide uh, you know, time and attendance files daily or manager approved hours daily? Do you have to uh, put up a funding account for the advances so that the provider doesn't have to carry the capital, right? The, all these things. And so for us, the decisions that we made at Zazu uh, was to bind ourselves very tightly and closely with amazing payroll partners like Assure. And so via that integrated tight access to data and that relationship with the payroll partner and the client, all of your clients, as you said, can have Zazen turned on in seconds and employees can use us in minutes from those seconds. Right. So all that said, if I'm an employer, what is a, what is a successful rollout to my workforce look like? And I'm thinking there's existing employee communications and how do I, how do I, maybe encourage is the wrong word because I, I I want to. I want to create the. the I want to let them know of the opportunity that exists, but I also want arms distance so that I'm not up in their business about around private matters. But so there's. I'm thinking there's two big buckets. There's the existing employees. How do I communicate with them to get this rolled out successfully in a way that is defined successful by the employees, not me? But then I'll as the employer for this war for talent. How do I? How do I successfully implement? a non-demand pay solution to recruit and, and, and retain. Yeah. So for the existing employees, you know, and again, this is, you know, I think many providers are, are utilizing the same basic tools, but I can just speak for what, what we do. Um, you know, we, we provide the collateral for awareness so that the employer isn't having to say, Hey, you know, every single day, Hey, remember you have this, remember you have this, remember you have this. There's, there's a, a poster in the break room that provides information. There's, Often the information that's handed out at the time of hiring, there are, you know, say the employee might actually receive an invitation to uh, enroll at the time of hiring, either from the employer directly or from, from us in some cases. And so the awareness in the existing employee base is actually pretty, pretty, pretty clear as to how that's done. Yep. Uh, it does fluctuate a bit by 
uh, kind of determined by what the communication tools an employer may or may not have. And actually what I've learned in the last, you know, a few years in particular is that uh, employers are actually pretty limited in the ways they can communicate with their employees quite often. So we, we fill that gap by doing it for them or by, you know, giving them tools. In more Shane, like, like, like what, what platforms or means do they not have available that you might've suspected? What are the ways that you guys fill the gap? Yeah, like even just emailing employees in some cases, right? There's not a tool that makes that simple for them or texting employees is definitely not something they currently have a lot of access to. And so it's kind of like what I've always called like reporting, right? They, people would always assume that employers or just any business would have access to really great reporting tools, but reporting is always a limiting factor against most things that employers use when it comes to software platforms or whatever else. So communication is much the same. Um, and so again, we, we, we don't claim to have an expertise in, in doing like, you know, sending text messages for them or sending emails for them, but we will fill those gaps because employers want employees to have the awareness and they just find it to be cumbersome, uh, to do it themselves. And so that, that's kind of on the existing employee base and also aligned with like onboarding new employees. So we'll give them all the resources they could want for that to be as, as seamless and easy for them as possible. When it comes to like applicants, you know, we will have, uh, clients put on-demand pay in the job listings. And so an employee comes on looking for a job, it won't just say X dollars per hour. It'll say, you know, on-demand pay available right away or whatever it might be. So they're doing that. Uh, there's stickers on windows that say hey, this employer, uh, is empowering the financial condition or financial wellness of their employees through Zazun. So for us, and I've seen that with other providers as well. And so employers can tout that they're doing that for employees. Um, those are probably the, the, the most common ways I would see. When it doesn't go well, what are the mistakes that employers make? What are the mistakes employees make? Employers, and again, not, not from a sales element, but just quite pragmatically, employers just choose the wrong provider, right? Um, and, and wrong is not like, oh, that provider's bad. I mean, I, we have great relationships with, with many on event pay, you know, quote unquote competitors, but they choose one that just doesn't quite meet what they have the capability to um, deploy, right? So if, if, again, to be very specific, if that provider requires daily up, upload of you know, CSV-based uh, timesheets, it, it may sound easy enough on day one, but after you've done that you know, 147 days in a row and six rows are inaccurate 40% of the time, which means all those employees, can, et cetera, et cetera, it becomes very tedious and you go, man, I, I really shouldn't have done that. I'm not a large enough entity to justify having a person have a full-time job in, in yeah. managing this uh, on-demand pay provider. So that's probably the most common is choose one that is what you need it to be. And for most SMBs, that means it should be free and hands-off and automated and seamless. That's a really good point. I will, I will say, I mean, that, that was one of the big reasons why we chose you guys. We vetted everybody. And I think lots of really good, well-established vendors in that space that's just growing so fast. But it was because you guys had the willingness to work with payroll only clients and didn't require these daily time and attendance feeds. I mean, if you're, you know, we got a lot of customers that use our time and attendance, whether it's a facial recognition or it's a badge swipe or a fingerprint or whatever. Um, but if you're a restaurant that has your employees are already punching in on the point of sale system, I mean, now how you get that information into payroll and then that into an out of demand pay vendor. We just want it to be as simple as possible. So, I mean, I, 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 that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. And, and I will say like, you know, we, we focus on this internally as well. Like we, we do use, and we very much prize uh, time data. Like why, why wouldn't you? It reduces risk. It makes it, um, you know, the, the earnings uh, precise, you know, as far as exactly what the employees earn. But uh, I think aligned with your point, there, there's a lot of clients that do use time platforms and it's, and it's in a solution that makes it easy to get that data out to provider. There's a lot of companies that use a time platform that it just isn't very simple to get that out. They have to do a lot of manual steps. And there's a lot of companies that just don't use time systems. Um, and so for all of those, the best that we do and, and what we really have sat into and, and gotten quite good at is looking at the historical earnings and using an algorithmic calculation of those earnings with which to impute what an employee has earned. And we've done retrospectives and we've, we've gotten quite good at it. Uh, and that means that we can give a ubiquitous offering to a client and not have to worry about, you know, some can use it and some can't. Right. Shane, anything else that employers do you think need to know about on-demand pay? You know, it, it is, and I, I lovingly tell this to my, my sales team, right? It's like the, uh, selling on-demand pay is not, it's not hard. It's free. 
it has amazing value. People are asking for it. Like the only really things you have to overcome are the inaccurate assumptions of what on-demand pay is or isn't or what it takes to deploy it, right? And so it's not that common anymore, but our conversation around kind of that paternalistic view of, oh, this is bad for my employees. Like that's yeah. far less now than it used to be, but you kind of cover that. Um, but more so than not, it's like just the assumption that it's costly or it's it's a hassle or it's going to take a lot of their time or they have to fund it themselves or whatever it is. Like as soon as you shoot down all those things, there's not much else that employers need to know. I mean, it's, and I love how you phrased it earlier. I can't remember exactly what you said, but like, it's just like, it, 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 there's no reason not to do it uh, is what I would throw out there. And by all means, if somebody can find a reason other than like a particular requirement of a particular vendor based on the capabilities of an employer, like other than that, I, I, I don't know why every employer wouldn't have this live imminently. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay, Shane, uh, super helpful information. I, I think I think there's still an awakening that's happening. Um, I feel like there's this trend here where the employers have always done what they had to do to pay their employees. And I'm getting this kind of madman uh, scene replaying in my head. Hey, you, you know, uh, your compensation is your reward. What are you complaining about? There's this kind of old school mindset of uh, employers to provide the pay and yes, benefits as I'm required to by the Affordable Care Act uh, or to be competitive in the marketplace. But I, but this war for talent, I keep coming back to it. It's real. And this is, this is a new world we're in. This is not just a post pandemic world. This is a, the, the, the demographics literally have changed based on birth rates 30, 40 years ago. Um, that there aren't the replacement workers entering the workforce as there are retiring in that shrinking pool. Uh, unemployment's at 3.7%. It's been here for about two years. That's about, that's the lowest. It's been at that rate for almost 40 years. This is not going away. And it doesn't matter who's sitting in the White House. It's a, it's, it's a supply of labor issue. And so if employers are going to be competitive and attract entry-level workers, um, and this isn't just entry-level. You talked about sixty and $80,000 folks that are consuming this product and, and accessing their wages uh, uh, in this way. Uh, man, I, I just can't imagine why you shouldn't consider it. I think it's a, tip, a shifting of mindset from employers of, what is what is the payroll and HR and benefits transactions that I must process versus okay what are the additional things that I can do to help my employees in ways that maybe aren't traditional in in, in that you know I'm rambling here but it, it 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 is part of a different mindset I think employers need to engage in it, it is and and I think you know I because I've been in this space for so long I have to remind myself that and you use the term awakening right like. That, that is the case. Because to me, I feel like, oh man, it's, we're, we're so far along. I've been doing this forever and everybody must know about it now. And, and even outside of employers, like just talking with all the, the personnel under, under our you know, partners and like in a, in a room of account managers or sales reps or whoever and say, hey, who knows what on-demand pay is? And it's definitely a good chunk, particularly with partners like Assure where it's like, hey, we're, we're really getting the word out here. But like, there's still a lot of payroll professionals that have no idea what it is. And then if you go down a layer to businesses and maybe even like attack it from like a, um, uh, you just out and about and you, you, you have a conversation with a buddy or, or somebody who owns a business and you bring it up and they're like, well, what, what is that? I have no idea. Right. Like it's still a huge amount of space to cover, to get people not only to deploy it, but to even understand what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Well, hopefully today's conversation is uh, a, a help in, in helping people to see what it could be and how it might help their business and uh, more than just being altruistic in trying to help your employees. It's a damn good thing to do in and of itself. Uh, but for the capitalist pigs uh, uh, among us uh, that, that there's real business benefits to you as, as, as employer as well. Shane, thanks for joining me today. I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, my pleasure. Appreciate the invite, Mike. And everybody else, uh, uh, if you got value from this conversation, if you liked it, I would encourage you to like comment or share. Uh, subscribe on the platform of your, of your choice. Uh, go to our YouTube channel and, and subscribe there. Uh, 
Until next week, we will talk to you and hopefully the, uh, join you in your mission to grow your business. Thanks, Shane. That's it for this episode of Mission to Grow. Thanks for joining us today. For show notes and more episodes, visit us at missiontogrow.com. If you found this content valuable, I invite you to share it with a friend and subscribe to the show. If you really want to help, I'd love it if you left a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen. Mission to Grow is sponsored by Assure. Assure helps more than 100,000 businesses get access to capital, stay compliant, and develop the talent they need to grow. To learn more about how Assure can help your business grow, visit assuresoftware.com. Until next time.